It's my pleasure to turn over this evening to Professor Augustine Fuentes. Oh, now I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for these, uh, Dr. Donnelly, for the wonderful introduction. I'm going to steal the clicker. Uh, and uh, for setting the stage perfectly uh, for what we're going to talk about today. Um, rather than telling you what is, what evolution is, I'm going to spend a lot of today demonstrating what evolution is not. And, and there are reasons for that. But I want to demonstrate what evolution is not, in particular, what human evolution is not, by way of understanding the patterns and processes of this 99.9%. .9%. The last two million years, actually, I'm going to start a little bit further back than that, to illustrate how important an understanding of human evolution is here and now, today, in the 21st century. So, let me uh, talk with you for a while, and then hopefully I will get through this quickly. It's many millions of years of information, uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So let's first talk about the problems with people's interpretations of evolution. So for example, this is a very common assumption, the sort of chimpanzee or um, uh, uh, ape-like thing, right? You know, we start at one end, sort of crawling and slowly stand up walking as man. Okay, this is wrong, it is misleading, it is erroneous, and it makes evolution an easy target for people who want to argue against it. Evolution is a fact. Life has changed on Earth over time, but not like this. So this representation is wrong. I'm going to demonstrate very quickly how it is. So that's one representation that's very importantly erroneous. A second thing to keep in mind is that most people think, well, evolution explains common sense or the way things are in the world. So another common assumption about human evolution is that males and females have evolved differently, that we're a different species. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and we are, uh, not that many laughs, you guys aren't looking at this, are you? Right now. I don't even have to explain it. That's how commonsensical it is. So many people think this is what human evolution does for us. It is understanding evolution tells us why men and women just can't get along and are so different. No, uh, this is absolutely wrong. A third and very common assumption is that if we think about it at our heart, as Thomas Hobbes told us so eloquently, if we strip away the veneer of culture, there is a beast within us, an aggressive, violent creature that has to be tamed by society and by culture. Yeah, um, that's not true either. Finally, and probably most pernicious today, is this notion that when we look around the world and we see diversity, different groups, different ways of being, different colors, different heights, different bodies, different ideologies, different languages, that evolution helps us understand that diversity as different lineages, different threads, different strands of humanity that are based deeply in genetic divisions. Yeah, that too is not accurate. So what I'd like to do here today for the next 30 minutes or so is to clarify things a little bit as to what we know from the study of human evolution. How do we know these four examples are incorrect, not just incorrect, but erroneous and misleading in a way that's damaging to our societies, to our communities, and to our knowledge? All right, so clarifying, I would like to sort of clarify first, what, how do you represent human evolution as opposed to this sort of three things lined up into some guy? Um, then I want to point out what evolution is, because pretty much everyone in the popular notion, and many people in the academy, have a very poor understanding of what actually evolution is. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why humans don't have a necessarily violent nature. Now here I'm going to point out necessarily violent. We can be violent. In fact, we are the best critters on the planet at cruelty and violence. But it's not our go-to, and it's not the specific target or result of a particular pathway in human evolution. Um, I also point out that females and ma males are the same species. You all know that, but most people don't act like that. Uh, and finally, that there's only one single human lineage. Race does not equal biology, but racism has important biological and social impacts. All of these things are laid absolutely clear by understanding 
human evolutionary processes and patterns. The rich data from our bones, our genes, our material remains, and the ways in which we've imagined them and created them. And then I'll take a few moments to sort of point out why this understanding, why understanding what human evolution really is, is critical for the here and now. So let's start. Okay, so how do we represent evolution? Darwin did it very well, right? Y'all know who Darwin is? So uh, Charles Darwin wrote this. This is a doodle from Darwin's famous notebook, one of his notebooks. And he wrote, I think, and then he wrote this. It's absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely brilliant. He thought that the world is not lineal descent, but rather branching patterns of relationships. And so I'll just modify it a little bit to give it more accurate. This is actually what he meant. So this is all of the probably maybe let's say we've cataloged about 20 million species. There's probably, um, I'm sorry, we've cataloged about 5 million species. There's probably 20 to 25 million species on the planet. Now pointed out here that very, most life on the planet is very, very small, right? So everyone knows 5% of all life on the planet are beetles. <laughs> when uh, a group of theologians asked uh, JDS Haldane, the famous uh, biologist, uh, what one could make of the creator by looking at his creation. And uh, JBS Haldane responded, an inordinate fondness of beetles. <laughs> I don't know if he actually said that, but it's really funny and it works. <laughs> the point being is that we humans are just one little teeny cluster here on things that have sort of backbone-like things. And of that teeny cluster of backbone-like things, we're a smaller cluster of sort of animal backbones with some hair, called mammals, and of that smaller cluster of animals with backbones and hair, we're actually part of this big cluster of things called primates, right? And in this big cluster of things called primates, we're right here, uh, clustered with a bunch of things we call apes. So this is the only appropriate way to represent human evolution. We don't come from apes, we are part of apes. Or as my colleague, the anthropologist John Mark says, we are ex-apes. Why are we ex-apes? Because we actually have our own history for the last eight to 10 million years, separating out from this lineage while they all went evolving in their own ways. As Darwin thought, everything is about relationships, about branching. But in evolutionary processes, that branching tells us about similarities and differences, continuities and discontinuities. And so what's really amazing about our story is we have eight to 10 million years of absolute distinctive evolutionary processes from everything else. That distinctive lineage is called the hominins and there are a whole bunch of them, but we are the last hominin standing. Every single other hominin has gone extinct. There is something particularly distinctive about us. So this is the right way to represent evolution, okay? So I never ever want to see any of you use that little stick figure or walking up thing. And if you see anyone presented to you, just tell them why it's wrong. <laughs> Context matters. This kind of understanding makes a big difference. All right. So now we know what human evolution looks like. What about what evolution is? Now, most people think this, as I'm going to show you in a moment, is what evolution is. And here I rely on my favorite philosopher of biology, Gary Larson. I know you missed the rain rights, Bobby, but they were weak and stupid people. That's why we have wolves and other large predators. <laughs> the idea that survival of the fittest, which Darwin did not put in his first edition, he was actually bullied into putting it in later. Survival of the fittest meaning that there's a bunch of things out there and the biggest, fastest, strongest, meanest win. Uh, okay, that's not accurate. That's not what evolution is. This is not it at all. Really, evolutionary processes are unbelievably complex. From Darwin and Wallace, we know that there's variation in nature, and some of that variation is inherited, and some of that variation that is inherited does a little bit better, and therefore things across many, 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 many generations start to look like that variation does better. That's natural selection. It's actually quite boring. We also, since Darwin, the last 150 years, have actually learned some stuff biologically. And it turns out that we now know that genes move around and the way in which genes move around we call gene flow and that impacts things. We also know there's something called genetic drift, random effects that change genes and structures and bodies. And we know in the last 50 years with the extended evolutionary synthesis, this expansion, that it's not only about genes. It's actually about cells and tissues and development and bodies and groups and communities. We now know that there are many, many, many processes 
that facilitate change over time in the biological world. And the bottom line is that it's not just about genes and survival of the fittest. Let me use a quote from the biologist Kevin Leyland at the University of St. Andrews that summarizes where we are with evolution right now. Organisms are constructed by deve in development, not simply programmed to develop by genes. Living things do not evolve into pre-existing environments, but co-construct and co-evolve with their environments in the process changing the structure of ecosystems. Evolution is dynamic. It is interactive. It is mutually co-constructive. And it involves genes, tissues, bodies, organisms, groups, communities, and entire ecosystems. Okay, That's probably not what most people think evolution is. It's more complicated, but it's more real and more important. All right, so now we know what human evolution looks like, and we have a little bit of an idea, at least a general idea, that evolution is not just about big stuff eating small stuff and certain things living. It's about interactions, about mutually reshaping. It's about dealing with the challenges of the world in a myriad of different ways as bodies, minds, and communities and ecosystems change. Okay, so how do we know we are not evolved as aggressive creatures, right? If you look at this, if I showed this picture and say, this is a good example of human evolution, in general, most people would say, yeah, right? This is what happened. Okay, well, what do we know? Well, first off, <laughs> violence and aggression is not a thing. It's actually a huge array of patterns and processes. That is not like, so you can't say violence evolved like our femur evolved. I can show you over time the change in the structure and the makeup of the femur in the human lineages. I cannot show you violence because it's a whole bunch of different things. Okay, so violence or aggression itself does not evolve, but patterns or maybe capacities to commit kinds of violence might, right? So maybe, maybe there's some kind of underlying biological context that we can target it on and say, well, there's some genes and some physiology or some molecules in humans that have been targeted by evolutionary processes that make us very good at being violent and aggressive. Um, uh, one of the most uh, popular ones is the warrior genes. Anyone here ever heard of the warrior gene? MAOA? OK, so uh, a, a monoamine oxidase is it, involved in the serotonin uptake uh, uh, components in your brain. And it has been argued, at least in some men, they actually don't study this in women, but in some men, with certain variants of this gene, they seem to be more aggressive. They show up in prison more often, and, and they commit uh, sexual violence more often. So people said, well, this is evidence of a kind of selection for certain types of violence. So uh, you can research this, and many, many people have. And there's a lot of really complex outcomes. I was participant in a uh, uh, National Geographic study that resulted in a, um, uh, a TV show uh, that was uh, along with this guy, who's frequently very angry. Um, he's a uh, spoken word artist and uh, formerly uh, frontman for a uh, punk rock uh, band called Black Flag. His name is Henry Rollins. And in this Nat Geo special, I was one of the science advisors. What we do is get a bunch of scientists together and take a bunch of blood from very angry people, bikers, uh, ultimate fighters, and some more mellow people. Nuns, uh, some, uh, sorry, nuns, uh, sorry, uh, brothers, and they don't study it in women brothers and uh, some monks and uh, all the scientists who are studying. The, uh... <laughs> so what, what they went is try to find, uh, Henry's an angry guy, and he said, went to talk to a bunch of angry, violent people and look around and try to understand why we're violent, understand why we're mad, and find that genetic, that evolved pattern that makes us this way. And so, I mean, just looking at me and Henry here, you know who has a copy of the warrior gene, right? <laughs> Me and two of the monks. <laughs> but, you know, the happy academic or meditative contemplative lifestyle gene just doesn't sell. That doesn't sound as good. The bottom line is there is no gene for violence. There are no genes for violence. There's a huge array of ways in which our body can be co-opted to commit violence, but there is nothing in the human system that is targeted, not like rams with horns for hitting each other, not like big claws for scratching, not like big teeth for biting, there is nothing in the human system that is targeted through evolutionary histories for violence and aggression. Well, okay, so let's just really quickly say we're primates. Maybe there's not a targeted thing, but maybe there's some pattern of our primate heritage. We already just sort of inherited this violent context. So we can ask, what do we learn from primates? 
Well, if we study primates, which people have been doing for more than a century and hundreds of thousands of hours of study, uh, we know that they almost never kill each other. They die, they fight, but intraspecific lethal violence is actually quite rare. It's much more common in humans than in other primates. We also know that um, most aggression, that is frequent aggression, does not correlate with severe aggression. Who do you think primates fight with most? They no, well, sometimes it's of the same sex. It's close, though. That's very close. They fight with those closest to them. They fight with their family members. Who do you guys fight with most? <laughs> those closest to you socially in a tight social group are the ones that can have the most frequent aggression, but it's the least severe aggression on average. Humans depart from this because we have high rates of homicide and lethal aggression in very close people. So we're actually quite different. And if you look at the rest of the, there's some chimpanzee violence and some other things, but actually, if you look at what primates can tell us about violence in humans, it's pretty much nothing. Okay, so aggression can't evolve the way a femur can. Um, there's no sort of biological system for violence targeted in humans, and, and the other primates don't help us really understand why humans can be so violent. Well, let's just look to our past. I mean, what we can really ask is, let's look at the fossil record. Let's look at our bones of the past and past populations and ask, is there evidence that for the last two million years, humans have been violent? Well, yes. We do see examples of violence. There's a 400,000-year-old individual from Atapuerca, Cima de los Huesos in northern Spain, whose head was cracked in and he died, probably hit by another member of his group or another group. In the last two million years, we have a whole whopping about 18 examples of this, over thousands and thousands of fossils. So when you look at our history, oh, sorry, when you look at our history, you see that before about 12,000 years ago, only about 2% of all of the remains we find have evidence of lethal or really significant violence. That doesn't mean violence didn't happen. It's just that it's not that well represented in the fossil record. This number doubles between 12,000 and about 6,000, and then doubles again in more recent times. So humans, in the last 12,000 years, at least materially show more evidence of large-scale lethal aggression. Well, that's interesting. How have we changed massively in the last 12,000 years? Have we evolved new bodies? No. New minds? No. New genetics? Not necessarily. We have created new societies, new ways of living, and new ways of being together. The last 12,000 years have seen the advent of domestication, sedentism, agriculture, towns, cities, increased gender roles, inequality, property, ideologies about ownership. In fact, in the last 12,000 years, we've made it much more profitable and much more possible to achieve violence, to strike out at others, and to organize in order to do that. In fact, our cooperation is such that we are great at fighting now. Now, we know that from the fossil and archaeological record, but we also know this. So we have evidence of lethal interactions and of violence in the fossil record. You can see here, these people weren't killed by pencils. Those are actually pointing to arrows that are <laughs> inside. I show this slide all the time. They're like, what? They were just stabbing each other. This is a 12,000-year-old cemetery. These individuals, about 50 individuals, almost 25% of the population was killed in a war. But for every example we have like this in our history, especially even our recent history, when we know it's more common, this is much more frequent. For every one example of lethal violence and aggression, we have 10, 20, 30, 40 times the examples of other causes of death and of cooperation and community. Here is an adult female and two children buried hand in hand in this cemetery, probably died from an illness. So humans have been aggressive towards one another. We have committed violence, but it never has been more common than compassion and caring than cooperation. That's what the evidence from human evolution shows us. And it is deep, deep in our past. Okay, how did the sexes evolve? 
Well, this is the common way we have of thinking about sort of human evolution. This idea that there was somehow on the savanna a million years ago or a couple million years ago, there was a male and a female and they were out there roughing it. And, and apparently from this, the female was very nervous, but the male was looking forward and is pretty confident that they're going in the right direction. You should infer from what I just told you that cooperation, groups, working together, it's actually pretty important. So at this time, this is about, those individuals probably lived a little over three million years ago, an Australopithecus uh, species. At the time they were out there, there were at least 22 large carnivores that stood 1.5 to two meters tall. These things, if they lived like this, we would not be here. This is what our evolution looks like. We know from very early on, at least two million years ago, our ancestors got together, they began to collaborate, male and female, young and old, to identify the patterns of predators, to avoid them, to move around them, to understand when they're making kills, when they're dangerous, when they're not dangerous, to be able to forage on their kills, to increase nutrition, to collaborate, to make their lives possible. Because at two million years ago, our ancestors were a meter and a half tall, they were naked, fangless, hornless, clawless. What did they have? They had each other. And they used each other and collaborated and created. So when we talk about male and female evolution, we actually start with evolution of our genus, the genus Homo, and of our species, the species sapiens. Not about men doing this and women doing that. There are differences, and we're going to get to them, and they're very important. But we have so much evidence that allows us to understand these basic patterns. So, for example, I want everyone to imagine one scene here. Now that you've just looked at this, I biased you. I want you to close your eyes and imagine stone tool making. Okay? All right, open your eyes. Who's making stone tools? Women here, but when this is done without priming with this slide, 99% of the people, male and female, identify males as the stone tool makers. So we have tons of stone tools, lots and lots of stone tools for millions of years. 3.3 million years ago is the first stone tools, 2 million years ago the first sort of stone tools in our genus, and from then on it just cascades. What is the evidence we have for gender bias in the construction of stone tools? You know where I'm going, make a wild guess. Zero, none, nothing, not one iota. So there's no difference in the making of stone tools. By about four or 500,000 years ago, we get some large game hunting, and in large game hunting, with close, uh, close contact, that is when you're stabbing a mammoth or something, it looks like there might be some difference between males and females. However, evidence from Neanderthal sites suggests that both males and females were receiving the same types of injuries. We don't know, we don't have a time machine, but they were receiving the same type of injuries and they were both quite robust, much more robust than us today. We also know that if you take a newborn infant and rub it on a male human, don't do this, you'll get in trouble, but if you were, happened to do this, you would get the same kind of physiological psychoneuroendocrine, what we call hormone response, as you get in females. The levels would be slightly different, but human males respond with the same kick in progesterone, the same kick in oxytocin that females do. There is very robust evidence published by my colleague Lee Gettler, uh, by Peter Gray, by a number of individuals that demonstrate that male humans have evolved a capacity for extreme caretaking that is quite rare in mammals. Sarah Hurdy and her colleagues have demonstrated that early on in our evolution, cooperative caretaking by males, by females, by young and by old actually formed a basis that allowed humanity to extend our childhood, to extend our brain growth, and to become who we are. Notice I haven't said anything about male-female differences yet. Right? The reason is I want to establish this baseline, what we know about human evolution, before we get to this stuff. Right? We know males and females differ in bodies. We're mammals. There are males and females. There are reasons for that. Right? Part of that has to do with chromosomes. Part of it has to do with mature reproductive function. Right? One of us gives birth, the other does not. That leads to physical physiological and structural changes. In humans, it turns out that male upper body strength is slightly larger. Right, slightly higher. We have, uh, males have higher density uh, muscle tissue, uh, slightly more dense than females. Females have more fat interspersed in there, and that has to do with reproduction and lactation. Um, on average, uh, males are about 10 to 15% larger than females in any given population, um, and that there's differential fat deposition and usage. And anyone here who's an adult will know that. Uh, males lose fat and eat it much faster than females do, and we do from different places. 
Um, so there are some important biological differences that evolved over evolutionary time. Um, and we know that males grow about 10% or 15% more. That's actually how males get larger. Females stop growing before males do. All right. However, if we think about these biological differences, and I give you the difference in height, average height, which is one of the most consistent differences, if we think about what that actually means, we have to sort of map it out. So even though we have a 10 to 15% difference in any population between males and females on average, there is a 78% overlap. That means if I took at random males and females from this group, you would have a 78% overlap. As you can see, that sort of extends, whoops, that extends um, such that many, many females are in the male end and many males in the female end. That means that even these distinct physiological, physical differences that have evolved actually have a lot of overlap between them. So for example, there are many, many, many women who are much larger and more muscular than I am, right? If Serena Williams was here, she could beat me at pretty much any physical act I could imagine, right? So physical differences via our evolution matter but they're not nearly distributed in the way we think of. They're not dichotomous. They're distributed in overlapping range. Here's another important one. So we know there's these physical differences that are important that show up via human evolution, but when you actually look at psychological assessment of male and female behavior, Janet Shibley Hyde did this with 5,000 studies over a meta-analysis, and by now uh, the group has done over 11,000 studies in their meta-analyses. Shows that yes, there are some really clear differences between males and females, but they constitute less than four or five percent of the major patterns in humanity. There are some big differences. There's a lot of sort of the spread there, but males and females overlap massively in behavior. Why is that? Because we're the same species. Of course, if you imagine, no, most of you don't think when you see a seagull, it's like, oh no, well that's a male seagull. It can't possibly be doing what a female seagull does. <laughs> but, if you lock an adult male and female human in our society, in the United States today, into an MRI and you ask them a bunch of questions, you show some pictures of, of pornography or you show them pictures of sports or violence or particular phrases or sayings or images or colors, their brains will light up differently. Their brains will respond differently as adults. Ah, this must be it. This must be the evolutionary difference. Actually, all that shows us is how amazing, creative, and imaginative humans are. What you see here is the end product of culture. This is a composite of uh, 40 males and 40 females at 18 to, 8 to 13 years old, 13 to 17 years old, and 17 to 20 years old. Uh, males on the left, females on the right. At the 8 to 13 year old, when you assess them with the same criteria, the same stimulus, there is no statistically significant difference between their brains. You can't tell them apart. At 13 to 17, it becomes clear. Some areas start to differentiate. And by 17 to 22, on specific stimulus, male and female brains respond quite differently. Why? Because our brains develop how they respond. That's how our brains work. They learn over time. What you're seeing here is called gender. We learn in our own societies what roles are expected for males and females. And that learning becomes biology. It becomes our neurobiology. We are the most creative, imaginative, and complicated critters. So much so that what we see, what we think, what we expect, actually folds itself into our minds and creates neuronal, chemical, biological connections in who we are. OK, so violence and sex differences. There is violence, but it's not our go-to. There are sex differences but they are fewer than the similarities. And why the differences appear, especially in adults, is a very interesting story. Let's get to one that is very relevant right now. No one in this room needs this to be explained. Racism, racial differences, and racial animosity is a critical component of everyday life in the United States and for much of the world. The assumption is and this is an assumption even held by many people who will not admit to it, is that yes, there's a lot of variation out there, and yes, there's a lot of overlap, but really what we have is we have sort of this clusters, lineages of humans that have evolved independently 
Of course they connect, but they're really different things. So for example, we've got this sort of African cluster. You with me? You guys recognize this? This African cluster, we got a European cluster, then we got a sort of Asian cluster that we, you know, sort of spreads everywhere. And then Australia, which we just ignore because it messes with everything. <laughs> but we can ask, actually, biologically and evolutionarily, is this what race looks like? Is this what human evolution looks like? Or is there evidence for this kind of distinction, a sort of an African lineage, a European lineage, and an Asian lineage, with, yes, some mixing, but really distinct evolutionary histories? We base a lot of this on skin color. Um, let me just tell you how skin color works. How many of you just saw a new article that just came out, big news, Cheddar Man, a 10,000-year-old fossil in uh, the UK. They just reconstructed and looked at his genetics and found that he was very dark. Um, pretty much everyone in Europe 10,000 years ago, except for Neanderthals, were very dark. And Neanderthals were already dead by that time. So, How does skin color work? We use it. Um, it turns out that there are things called melanocytes, and they produce melanin. We all have melanocytes. All humans have melanocytes. All humans produce melanin. There's only two colors of melanin, black and brown. We all are black and brown. What happens, though, is how your melanin, melanocytes are distributed, whether they're spread even or clumped, and whether they produce a lot of melanin or little melanin, makes you look light or dark. Because really, it's not color. It's about light reflectance. So you have very evenly distributed melanocytes producing a lot of melanin. You absorb a lot of light. Your skin looks darker. If you have very clumped melanocytes producing little melanin, you bounce a lot, you reflect a lot of light, and your skin looks lighter. And it turns out there's a reason for that. If you look at skin color across the planet, it turns out that it, darker skin concentrates around the equator, right? Um, just where the incidence of ultraviolet light is most powerful. What does evolution tell us? Humans evolved a capacity to withstand the challenging rays of UV light because we spent most of our evolutionary time in these areas. So humans evolved an even spread of melanocytes with a lot of melanin production for dark skin to protect them from cancer-causing ultraviolet light. But once humans started recently moving into northern climes, we can't move into southern climes because there's no land. Once we moved into very far northern climes, uh, it turns out we need a little UV light. And so evolutionary change began to occur, and melanocytes clust, clumped up and produced a little bit less. Right? Read uh, uh, Nina Jablonski's uh, book, Skin, that will explain all this. But we know where skin color comes from. Do you see three or five races there? No. Skin color doesn't get you race at all. OK, what about genetics? Well, we like to tend to think that we have these really diverse genetic uh, clusters. We've got at least you know, these three, and then maybe we could throw these in and say those are races too. Well, we can actually test genetically. So for example, if you take genetic samples, which Ancestry.com and all of those do all the time, um, and in the Q&A, if you want to talk about what's wrong with 23andMe and Ancestry.com, I'll be glad to. Um, you can take a sample from someone from Nairobi, someone from London, and someone from Beijing. And you could ask, can we identify these as part? Can I say, these three are different? And absolutely, yes, without a problem, clearly. So we must have three races, right? Black, white, and Asian. Well, if we take three populations here from Delhi, uh, from uh, Padang and Sumatra, and uh, northern China, who being are one of these places, and you test them, can you tell them apart? Absolutely, without a doubt, no problem. But wait, don't order yet. If you take three populations from what is called Europe, whoop, doesn't want to do that. There, whoop. OK, uh, from the Arabian Peninsula, sort of Russia here and uh, France, can you tell them apart? You already know the answer. Yes, absolutely, no problem. This is a weird pattern. And if you take three populations from Sub-Saharan Africa, not only can you tell them apart, they are more different from one another than any of those other populations. So human diversity is not mapped to these sort of uh, uh, racialized continental types. Why? Well, two reasons. One, humans for the last two million years have been moving around. And what do they do when they move around? They move around and encounter other groups of humans. And we have incredible data from the archaeological, fossil, and genetic evidence that humans moved around and frequently interfaced in ways that left reproduction on the table. And we even know the things we call different species, like Neanderthals, right? Everyone here in this room has some Neanderthal DNA in them, right? That didn't happen because you slipped and fell on some Neanderthal. 
Humans have been moving around and mating nonstop for over a million years. Um, and we know that human genetics doesn't look like this. From our understanding of human evolution, it actually looks like this. Every single population outside of Africa is a subset of the variation in Africa. There's more variation in Africa than anywhere else. And here's a little uh, uh, spoiler for the uh, 23andMe and uh, Ancestry.com. So right now, 23andMe uses 36 European populations in their baseline and nine African populations. That means they overrepresent the European heritage in your sample by about 4,000%. And they're only testing the 0.1%. They never tell you on your little chart there, you are, just like every other human, 99.9% .9 African. And then there's this 0.1% of stuff that moved around. This is what we know from human evolution. But it doesn't map out to our society. If you look at the world today, if you look at our society today, racism, inequality in access to healthcare, to social justice, to education, radically changes things like infant mortality rate. So right, the United States is about number nine in the world on average for infant mortality rate. We're about number 67 if you just look at African Americans. If there's not biological differences, if these aren't because of different lineages of humans, they're for another reason. Again, human creativity, imagination, inequality, cultural complexity, history, economics, politics. Evolution tells us that. Race is real. Absolutely, but it's not about biology, but racism has huge biological impacts. Okay, so I've just spent a lot of time telling you what evolutionary processes human evolution tells us and what evolution is not. So what, who cares? Well, it should be obvious from what I pointed out why I care. I think that all of these things are actually critical today. That the so what, understanding what evolution is, how it works, and what the data are from human bodies, bones, archaeological material remains, helps us understand why we are where we are today and what the future can hold. We are in the midst of some of the most aggressive, unequal, and erroneous assumptions, histories, economics, and politics in the history of mankind. Why do I say in the history of mankind? Why are most CEOs of Fortune 500 companies men? Is there genetics? Is it disparate evolution between male and female? No, it's historical, political, structural differences that have played out in ways that today are very real, but are not reflective of the deep evolutionary processes that we know that characterize humanity. So, for example, we know that there's been a lot, there's a lot of capacity for humans to, to be violent. We know that there's been violence in the past, but we know even more that the vast majority of our entire history in the past and in the present is characterized by humans working together, by humans coming together, by compassion, by moving towards connection and collaboration. I'm not for a moment saying our ancestors ran through the fields of daisies holding hands. But they worked together, they collaborated, they imagined new possibilities and made them real much more than they hit each other over the head. That's what human evolution tells us. We also know that it's very, very deep in our history. So we also know that there's no gender bias in making stone tools. We also know that humans had to work together across sexes, across ages, as a group in collaboration to make it in the world. We know that males and females are both geared towards, adapted to caretaking, that cooperative parenting is really important in human evolution. And we know that this collaboration between sexes is a central component of human evolutionary processes. We also know that the difference between males and females, while the physical differences might be large, the behavioral differences are much smaller than we thought. Why? We are the same species. We also know how those differences in the brain, the way we feel, the way we think about ourselves show up because they are engendered. It's part of our cultural history and heritage. And we have plenty of contemporary examples that show us that the way in which people have argued women are, for example, not capable of voting, right? 
You know, it's a strong argument in the United States against the suffragette movement. Women are not capable of holding office. Why? Because they menstruate. They go crazy. That's still in the popular culture. Is there any evidence that menstruation drives you crazy? No. What do most humans do under times of stress? That's the question to ask. Asking what do males and females do under times of stress is a very different teeny subset of that larger question about what humans do. All right, and we know what human genetics looks like. We know why humans have been moving around and mating. We know this from our uh, historical record. And we know why people are of different skin colors. Human evolutionary histories, understanding of human evolutionary stories, show us absolutely clearly that these two young girls, the fact that they are twins, doesn't surprise us at all. If we understand them as young women, it doesn't surprise us at all. Because if you understand what skin color is, if you understand what human evolution is, if you understand what human variation looks like, this makes total sense. Unless you live in the world today where these two individuals would experience very, very different realities <coughs> simply because of morphological variation that is absolutely standard and normative for humans. So race matters. It's just not what we think it is. And our evolutionary histories tell us that. So when we talk about human evolution, we think about six or seven million years of all of these different species of hominins, most of which go extinct by a million years ago, leaving only our genus, only our lineage, the humans. And there's a whole bunch of humans and human-like things, things just like us out there. And yet all of them went extinct too. We are the last hominin standing. Something about us is particularly distinctive. And the history that I've just shown you, what I've just demonstrated here, shows us what that aspect was what really makes humans distinctive. I'm going to suggest that it's creativity. It is the capacity to see the world as it is, to imagine possible alternatives, and to at least try to make the material reality. Putting all of our capacities together, it is this creativity, this imagination, this ability to connect, to work together, to collaborate, that makes humans really distinctive. And this is a whole book that I've written, and I could stand here for the next five weeks and identify all the different pieces of human evolutionary history that go to support this. But I think you see the fact that we have evolved this incredible caretaking, collaborative, compassionate creatures who are capable of unbelievable cruelty and violence is actually an acknowledgment of that imagination, that creativity. The fact that we have evolved as such collaborative, intra, intersexual workers working together way more than other mammals is also attributed to that creativity and the ability to change cultures and to change and separate the sexes into genders is another homage to that creativity. So creativity brings us to the highest highs and the lowest lows, and it is what makes human distinctive. But this wandering through our evolutionary past shows us that Collaboration, creativity, connection is what makes humans particularly distinctive. We know this. We know it's in the past. We know it's in the present. We have been able for two million years against all odds to create, to collaborate, to imagine what could possibly be and to try to make that into a reality. I say we follow our ancestors' lead and shoot for another two million years. Thank you. Questions? Rotten fruit? Well, first of all, we're oh. going to give you a thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is the formal thank you <laughs> to Dr. Fuentes for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Sure, no, that's fine. Does anyone have any questions? Burning desire? Yes. I'm just curious about your, uh, whether you have any comments on Stephen Pinker's thesis, uh, the Pinker's thesis, about the case of the Pinker's thesis, 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 Yes, he's wrong. <laughs> so we have published numerous critiques of Stephen Pinker's, so Stephen Pinker's work, Sorry, um, the question was Stephen Pinker in his recent book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and his new book, which is coming out, which is sort of argues that Western humanistic uh, political and economic processes have saved mankind. And I use mankind again on purpose. 
Steven Pinker argues that in our past we were highly violent and lethal and that that has, pattern has reduced over time because of the civilizing powers of culture, economics, and political uh, infrastructure, very much like Hobbes had argued. Multiple anthropologists have published data, and I showed you some here, refuting his argument about ancient violence. Um, that has been well published. He just chooses to ignore it. So that's not good science. You can't just ignore data. Uh, a group of colleagues and I, led by uh, Rahul Oka, an anthropologist at the University of Notre Dame, have recently published an overview of war dead and lethal violence over the last 10,000 years. And we found that, no, it has not reduced. In fact, it has not changed the percentage relative to war party size. It's a long statistical argument, but we recently argued that it turns out that you might say it's a percentage-wise, but you have this huge increase. So remember, when I was born in 1966, there were 3 billion humans. There are 7.5 billion humans now. We hit 1 billion in 1800. So to compare 7.5 billions to a 10 million or 20 million worldwide is really problematic. So you have to look at percentages and overall sort of war parties or lethal rating. And so we just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science a challenge against uh, his argument. Um, I think the problem with Pinker's argument is not that he's not a great writer and not that he doesn't have some good ideas, but you have to actually use all the data available and then map that out and see whether or not that supports the assertions. And there are numerous anthropologists who've demonstrated that it does not. So what, what are the hypotheses about? So what are the current hypotheses about what happens when people die in years ago? So after there's. After it's a very long, it's not just agriculture, but there's this a connection between increased density and population size, property and storage. So that's when we start to see the last 20,000 years, we see the advent of storage and goods, surplus goods. So basically the payoffs for organized lethal violence become realistic, whereas previously they were much, much lower. So that's one of the arguments. Also, we have uh, indications of cultural senses of identity and ideologies, new kinds of economies and political infrastructures that lend themselves to larger coordinated political systems and violence. It's a very long argument, but that's the, the nutshell. Uh, so I know like Professor, um, that be uh, Richard Fleming, but this guy from psychologist from the UK, I did Ian Lin. Uh -huh. um, I know he did a study on IQ differences between yes. sexes and races. I was wondering if that was like so I, I recommend you look at the psychological literature. You will see 99% of psychological literature contradicts uh, what Lynn argues and some others. There's the Flynn effect, which is a different effect. So if you look globally, first of all, understanding what IQ is. IQ is not intelligence. It's one way of assessing intelligence using particular kinds of uh, exams. Um, so IQ is interesting, and it does test some things. It doesn't test G, which is sort of a general intelligence, and there's big debates about what intelligence is. The bottom line is that, yes, just like I showed you with these racial things about sort of overall income, um, just like I pointed out that the most CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are white males, it turns out that there is stratification on IQ by race in the United States and in England, for example. Now, that those differences have been shrinking consistently over time, but there are still patterns. So the question is, do you explain those patterns via biology when the races you're testing are not biological units, or do you explain it via different kinds of social, structural, and historical patterns? And so I join with the vast majority of psychologists, of educational psychologists, developmental psychologists, and anthropologists who argue that those differences in IQ are not explained by inherent biological or neurological differences. They're explained by historical, political, economic, and social inequality. source of creativity? <laughs> uh, human evolution. There's the cheap answer. <laughs> so most people mistake creativity. They think of Einstein or Marie Curie or a, a genius individual. So creativity right, can be innovation by an individual, but those individuals always draw on enormous amount of other information. So the genus, the, the, where creativity comes from, are, we can talk about three areas. One is that over human evolution, over those two million years, our brains got really big, 
But what's interestingly, most of our brains just got big, what's called al allometrically, they scaled up. So you can take a monkey's brain or a small brain and just make it bigger. And if you look at the parts of our brain compared to the monkey's brain, ours just got bigger relative to the size, just because they grew. But not our frontal lobes. Our frontal lobes actually grew way more than they should have. What's in the frontal lobes? Premeditated planning, short-term memory, kind of connectivity. And so it turns out that our brains over evolutionary time have evolved a capacity for different types of mental representation, cued representation, which most things have. I had an apple yesterday, I walked by the grocers, I see an apple, I can imagine that apple and what it tastes like. But we also have what's called detached representation or offline thinking. I can sit here and be lecturing at you, but actually I'm thinking of a spectacled octopus flying through somewhere. Um, I've never seen a spectacled octopus with wings, uh, but I can create all of that. So neurobiologically, we have that capacity. We also have this incredible density of information transfer and the ability to store information, not just in our own minds, but in fact with others, and the longest learning period of any organism. 60% of our brain growth happens after birth. That's, there's no other mammal that has that. And in fact, if you look at a human infant, if you take, and most of you have seen human infants, if you were to put down a young, say a few month old human infant, um, and there was a predator approaching, what could it do? Nothing, no, they're useless. They can't do it, they're not useless, but they can't do anything for years and years and years. And that's an incredible system. One, because it brings all of the caretakers together in this cooperative parenting process. And two, because it allows for enormous amount of new development of neuroconnectivity. And so we have a distinctive template and density of learning and social acquisition of information that while many other organisms do this interestingly, we do it way, way beyond. So if you look at the sort of patterns of development of the brain, the sort of structures of the brain, and our tendency to use each other in collaboration, that generates a template from which creativity and imagination can spring in ways that it can't in other animals. Now, there are other smart animals that do really amazing things with social tradition. Orcas are incredible. If orcas, killer whales, had legs and thumbs, I'd be worried, but they don't, we do, so. <laughs> Fire, so the earliest evidence of use of fire is about a million years ago, but it's very spotty to about four to 500,000 years ago. By three to 400,000 years ago, human communities everywhere where we find them are using fire. Fire is critical, not just in imagination and creativity, but actually in changing the world. Fire changes for humans, and nothing else has ever controlled fire or made it. Fire changes for humans changes the day-night cycle. We're no longer locked in to day-night. We now have stuff where we can change uh, stones and bones into usable tools and change the way they, they, they work. So fire changes day to night, or night to day, changes uh, meat to filet mignon. It opens up all sorts of creative, adaptive ways of dealing with ecological challenges. Fire is one of the most important things humans did, and we've had it for three to 400,000 years. So E.O. Wilson is a, a is sort of one of the you know, great figures in, in uh, evolutionary biology and, and in biology and ecology writ large. However, um, he minimizes some of the diversity of evolutionary processes and minimizes some of the depth and complexity of these patterns. Um, I agree with his general uh, premise, uh, but his notion of biophilia, and he takes a fairly simplistic notion of processes of evolution, um, I would think, um, there's more complicated yet effective ways to draw some of those assumptions. But his basic ideas, I, I agree with for the most part. Um, there's a few that I don't. And I really, really disagree with him when it comes to human variation and races. Um, he has a fairly, I would say, um, erroneous and very problematic view for someone in his standing. Yes. Um. You said earlier that there was uh, no gene for violence. Right. I haven't heard about this in Guam now, but what about the Bruja, about the gene for homosexuality? So since the advent of genetic typing, genotyping, or even you know, electrophoresis, uh, people have been looking for genes for very, very, very complicated human things. Um, so uh, Armin Hammer, uh, not Armin, what is his name? Uh, that's the industrialist. Um, their last name is Hammer, a psychologist, a researcher, has been for years searching and publishing. I found the gay gene, 
Um, no, no, and no, and no. Um, there is no gene for sexual orientation. There's actually incredibly complex epigenetic influences on physiological and psychoneuroendocrine development that may have a lot to do with human sexuality, but human sexuality is never outside of social structure by definition. And so the idea that we would find a genetic, a simple genetic explanation for something as complex as human sexual preference, orientation, behavior, and engagement um, basically goes against everything we know about how genomics work. Um, so to the, not that people won't keep looking, but to date, People have been looking very, 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 very hard, and they haven't found any underlying genetics. Now, if you look in the literature, you'll see a bunch of arguments. Oh, this one is it. This one is it. Follow that five years downstream. You'll find that in each case, the data are refuted or not replicable, that no one else is able to find that same uh, connection. Uh, but, but that makes sense. I mean, either, you know, we look at complex human behaviors. So, for example, the majority of major league shortstops come from the Dominican Republic, right? Um, if I were to propose a gene for shortstop in the Dominican Republic, you would all laugh at me. But it's the same kind of thing. We're reducing, we're presenting a wrong picture of genetics. Genetics are incredibly complex, really important, but they're not simple, right? Humans have about 20,000 genes. A flatworm has about 26,000. <laughs> Given that, I think we're a little more complex than a flatworm. So this idea of gene, direct one gene, one complex social behavior, uh, that's, that's gone by the wayside. Um, I love Mendel and his peas, um, but, but that way of thinking about genetics is, it's just not borne out by contemporary genomic and epigenomic and proteomic analyses. Yes? Nope, nope, that's just normal. That's how brains work. So if I were to show you uh, 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 someone raised in Japan, someone raised in Uganda, and someone raised in southern Chile, right, and show them the same kind of things, their brains would actually fire different for a lot of things, whether the same sex or different sex. And that's because our brains, actually our culture, becomes neuroanatomy. That's the way we learn. Remember, we're born with those small brains and they grow enormously. That's their restructure. It's actually amazing. But if you take, like, a human brain from 500 years ago and a human brain today, you couldn't tell them apart. And in fact, if you take any male and female brain and you just put them here, there's absolutely no way, aside from the male brains, on average, might be slightly larger. There's no way to tell them apart while they're dead. That is gross morphology. And there's been tons published on, oh, well, no, there's this one piece of morphology, sort of uh, the, the corpus callosum. Uh, there's some other points in the frontal lobe. People have said, no, this is the difference between male and female brains. Zero. There's not any valid replicable things. There's a few interesting ones that people are falling down, so there might be some structural differences, but it's not like the brains are changing. The brains are highly plastic and malleable, and that's actually what makes human brains so effective. And so what you soak a brain in, basically, which culture you soak it in, is how it reorganizes. And they change over time. So for example, when you do nice MRI scans of someone who's 18 or 19 now, grown up uh, texting with thumbs, and my brain, where I can barely do this, you will find that the associated cluster in here, associated with the hand, the thumb part for that 18-year-old is huge minus teeny. So, but that's just the plasticity in the brain. That's what allows us to be so good at what we do. Our brain is really plastic. That also makes it really hard to be human. It takes 20 to 30 to 40 years just to learn how to deal with being a human, how to do it well. It's funny because we, we, we get to about 70 or 80 if we're lucky, and we're just like, oh, now I get it, and that's it. <laughs> a sign of that is, is the, the, the occipital, the, the, you know, all the bones, are, our, our skulls are made of a bunch of different bones. These final ones don't even fuse till your 70s or 80s. So our skull is constantly, it's always waiting, just say, you can learn more, you can learn more. That whole idea, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, that is not true. The brain, now, we all start senescing after a certain age, but, but that doesn't mean you can't develop new connections in the brain, new memories, new ideas, new ideologies, new imaginings. So that, that, that's a really interesting factum, right? That's a good datum. Now that really depends, it's under specific laboratory circumstances, particular context, right? So we can do amyg amygdala is something that it's a good shortcut to understanding fear response. There's a whole bunch of other ones. That one's really good just because when you're freaked out, it just goes, ah, and makes your body do a bunch of things. 
In the United States, there's many ways we can change the amygdala response, but with race, it's very hard. Uh, I encourage everyone to go to the Harvard Implicit Race Bias Test. It's an online test you can take for yourself. Um, it's very well established. Over five million people have taken it so far, um, and they're constantly uh, uh, building it up. It's a very good one, and it just shows how deep and ingrained implicit bias is in our society, regardless of who you are. Uh, it's, it's quite an impressive, terrifying, and an you know, it attributes to how powerful our neurobiology is. So how long would it take it to change? I don't know. But if you look at social and political shifts in the United States, sort of what's considered, so you know, no one freaks out when women wear pants. Right? It used to be illegal in many states. Right? Women can ride bicycles now. Right? Women can vote when they choose to. All of these things change over time, and as those things change, the way our brains acquire sort of what we're, we stew in that, that affects us. I mean, the, the great saying, everyone knows the saying, you are who you, you are what you eat, but really the more important one is, you are who you meet, right? Those around you, who you grew up with, that's the way you think. All of that is changeable, but it's really, really hard. In the United States, different societies have different ways of doing things. In our society, one of the most pernicious and damaging rigorous structures is that of racialized infrastructure, racialized ignorance, and racism. It's unfortunate. It doesn't mean it can't change. It has changed in the past, right? Um, the Irish became white. You know, things can happen. So there's actually a couple of things. So people are constantly looking to be able to tell to sex brains. Right now, there's no consistent pattern, but they're really drilling down. So a couple interesting things. There was this corpus callosum, this sort of connective tissue between your brain. That's the area where they found a lot. But the more you test, the more those differences wash out. The problem is, when you take 100 brains, 50 male, 50 female, there's more inter-individual variation. Than, so if you just say, what's the variation, sex gets swamped. But if you just say, what's the difference between sexes, you can find some patterns. So corpus callosum and a few other places. What's really interesting is recently there's a couple studies that show that in the interior cingulate gyrus up here under your um, frontal lobes, which is an area that has to do with some sort of higher cognitive function, there's an interest is that there's a difference in size and a little bit of structure in there that seems to pattern towards individuals who self-report higher degrees of femininity than masculinity. Now, initially when this was done, they're like, oh, well, these are female and those are male. But when they went back and looked at the, you know, the, the blind data, it turns out even males who reported higher self degrees of femininity seem to have this difference. I have no idea what that means. That's fascinating. Um, but it's going to be really hard to piece that, tease that apart. Um, there's substantial research going on in that area right now. That is the most promising one right now. But all the other stuff, we've tried forever to get real biological differences in the brain between males and females. And there, there just aren't any. There's plenty of functional ones in adults. Right? There's plenty of functional ones in adults. And what's fascinating is there's functional differences in the brain across cultures, across age groups, across time periods. Um, that's because the brain is highly plastic, unbelievably important, ridiculously complex, and, and really part of what makes us us. So uh, I'd be glad to stand up here afterwards for more questions, but I hate to keep people too long. So thank you so much for your attention, and uh, keep thinking. <laughs>